Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Bante. Good morning. Good morning, Swaminan, sir. Okay, this morning, uh, I'm going to speak on another topic. In the past, I spoke on some uh, deep subject. Today I'm going to speak on very light subject, very easy to understand. <clears throat> that is uh, sort of a beginning with a story of uh, how Venerable Ananda uh, Cured, cured a sickness of a bhikkhuni. <clears throat> uh, this is a very interesting story. And one day, when uh, when Mal Ananda was uh, living in uh, 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 what you call Gosita, uh, uh, Gosita, in Kosambi uh, state, <coughs> there was a monastery called Gosita Rama. When he was living there, in the same area, there was a Bhikkhuni. Bhikkhuni. She uh, addressed a man and said to him, uh, come, come, good man, approach Master Ananda. 
and pay homage to him, putting your feet on or your head on his feet, and uh, in my name, you go and pay homage to him, putting your feet on his feet, or putting your head on his feet, and pay respect to him in my name. So you have to then uh, then tell Venerable Ananda, Venerable Sir, so-and-so bhikkhuni is sick, afflicted, gravely ill. And she pays respect to Venerable Ananda. Uh, and then... <coughs> Tell him that I am very sick, afflicted, gravely ill. Uh, and say, it would be good if Venerable Ananda, uh, out of compassion, <coughs> uh, go uh, and visit this bhikkhuni. Okay? Then Venerable Ananda, out of compassion, uh, as he normally is, <coughs> uh, dressed up and went to see this bhikkhuni. This man was accompanied by this man. When this bhikkhuni saw Venerable Ananda coming, she immediately went to bed and covered her entire body from top to toes, entire body with uh, <coughs> with her body, with a rope. And then as soon as we went there, went there, uh, he immediately diagnosed her sickness <laughs> and uh, he said <coughs> uh, sister now this is how he tre he uh, treated her him he treated her sister this body is made up of, this body has originated from nutriment and depends upon nutriment. Nutriment is to be abandoned. <coughs> this body is, this body is, origin has originated from nutriment and uh, uh, in dependence on nutriment, uh, nutriment is to be abandoned. Nu dependent on nutriment, nutriment should be abandoned. This body, secondly, he said this body is originated from craving. In dependence on craving, craving should be abandoned. This body is... <coughs> Uh, originated from conceit and dependent independence on conceit, conceit should be abandoned. This body has originated from sexual intercourse, but in regard to sexual intercourse, the Buddha has declared the demolition of the bridge. Four statements. Four statements. So we explain them. When I explain each uh, statement, uh, the meaning will be clear. So he said when body is uh, uh, originated from uh, nutriment and independence of nutriment, Nutriment should be abandoned. For what reason was this said? 
Now, this uh, nutriment is called ahara. There are four kinds of ahara. They are called kabalinkara ahara, asahara, vinyana ahara, manosanchetana ahara. Four. <coughs> kabalinkara ahara means uh, solid food. <coughs> this body is, is uh, has originated from this uh, uh, body, this uh, uh, material food. For beings who are born, beings who are coming into birth, they all depend on material food, nutriments, nutriments. As we all know, without nutriment, we cannot live. This is one. And this nutriment uh, the desire for nutriment should be abandoned by using nutriment. And in uh, uh, Sanyutta Nikaya Buddha in order to make it very clear, gave a simile. Because in the Buddha's time, uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis uh, used to get more and more requisites, food, lodging, robes, medicine, and so forth. And as the Buddha became very popular, uh, people began to load him with all these things. And more and more monks came, people came, became monks, and uh, they began to consume food without much uh, reflection. Almost became very greedy and gluttonous. And therefore Buddha wanted to give them instructions using very, very stark, very strong simile. Very strong simile. <clears throat> when you hear the simile, you will be you will be shocked. You will be shocked. And just remember this is a simile. What is the simile? The simile is <coughs> eating the flesh of one's own son. So Buddha said, the, suppose a couple traveled in a desert, very long journey. So this couple had a lot of provision that they can could they could carry with them with their little son. So they cannot take too many provisions, but uh, they thought that would be enough to uh, use for in to to cross the desert. When they reach halfway. They were very thrifty and ate little by little. When they reached the halfway in the desert, all the provision came to an end. Then, the scorching sun, no water, no tree, no people. Uh, they are very thirsty, hungry, tired. Then, uh, they discussed between them and uh, said to each of them, the man said to his wife, uh, you kill me and eat my flesh and travel in the desert. 
wife said if i kill you i cannot live because i have no any job i have no tra no training and i cannot go along with my child therefore you kill me and eat and travel with the child so both of them uh, discussed and man said how can i live without you um i cannot uh eat you kill you then the man suggested well if both of us live we can uh make another child and they will let us kill the child kill the little boy and eat his flesh now this is the most difficult thing for both parents to do most difficult thing but because of this dire situation it is this is a simile remember simile uh, they kill the child and then <coughs> began to eat his flesh little by little no choice they don't uh, separate the uh, soft part hard part and so what what they want to eat that particular time they ate every time they ate they cry how ah, very so little dear boy with so much difficulties we brought him up now we have no child and so but they cry and cry and cry and cry and eat as time passes by the food is getting rotting stinky and smelly and yet they have to eat it to cross the desert so buddha says similarly <clears throat> he said monks he used this simile it actually has not happened did not happen but buddha buddha wanted to make it make his point very very strong and clear and leave very deep impression in these monks about uh, how they should use they consume food not with greed and so he introduced <coughs> this uh, system and he said uh, the because you eat this food uh, you consume this food neither for for amusement no for intoxication no for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness but only for the support and maintenance of this body for avoiding harm <clears throat> and for assisting the spiritual life consisting thus i shall terminate the old feeling of hunger and not arouse new feeling of by overeating and i shall be healthy and blameless and well at ease with this reflection you must see <clears throat> we at our place when we eat our meals uh, every day morning and noon we say this in pali of course uh, we don't eat and this is the, the tradition so venerable ananda said the food should be consumed with this reflection why is that so that we can 
reduce our greed for eating, greed for meals, greed for taste, whatever is offered, whether it is tasty or not. It is just to maintain this body. Not for beauty, not for building our muscles, and uh, go out and box and punch and wrestle, not for those things, but just to maintain this body. And thereby, using food, we reduce our greed. So that is why he said, dependent, independence of nutriment, nutriment should be redu reduced. <clears throat> independence of nutriment. Nutriment is to be abandoned. What is the nutriment? Desire. Desire. That nutriment increase our more desire. That nutriment of or this desire is the cause of life, birth, depending on desire, tanna pachya, upadana, upadana pachya, bhavo, vapachya jati. Dependent on craving, clinging arises. Dependent on clinging, uh, birth arises, bhava, becoming arises, becoming, dependent on becoming, birth arises. So that whole process of rebirth can bring to an end by reducing desire. Then Venerable Ananda said, <coughs> this body has originated from craving, in dependence on craving, craving to be abandoned. So, how is that? Desire should be abandoned in dependence of desire, craving. That is, <coughs> suppose a, a big coup, this refers to big coup, of course, uh, this can apply to any life, lay life as well, but uh, primarily Buddha, Ananda, and so forth address this to this particular discourse to bhikkhus. And he said, bhikkhus, <coughs> suppose there is a monk or bhikkhu that can apply to bhikkhuni and a lay person as well. Uh, this person hears that <coughs> such and such a bhikkhu attained full enlightenment uh, <coughs> with the destruction of all the things and realized himself with direct knowledge in this very life, the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom. That means, he attained uh, enlightenment. Uh, he attained practice samatha and vipassana uh, and attained uh, full enlightenment. Uh, and lives in peace without any desire. So a monk listened to it, monk heard about it. Then he, desire arises in him. Desire arises in him to attain that state of liberation, attainment of liberation. Jeto uh, vimurti panya vimurti, liberation by uh, by by uh, by the mind but that means uh, uh, some of the practice 
and vipassana practice he did and attained uh, full enlightenment. So he heard this and desire arises in him. Then he strives very hard, work hard, meditate, and uh, he attains that state. When he attained that state, his desire for attainment destroys. He had a desire to attain the state of enlightenment. When he attains that state, desire disappears. That is very interesting. It is just like you have a desire to climb a mountain. When you climb the mountain, your desire for climbing mountain is gone, disappears. So when Ananda said, craving, dependent on, dependence on craving, craving destroys. Dependent on craving, craving destroys. So the, this particular monk has a craving to attain liberation. And it's because that was his uh, uh, driving force. Uh, that That is the thing that encourages him to practice. And he, he has the reason. He became very enthusiastic. Uh, and he get, he get encouragement. And using the same, very same desire, he practiced very hard and liber uh, mindfulness, meditation, and so forth, live very noble life, moral life, ethical life, and dedicate his life and practice. And then he attained that state. After attaining that state of enlightenment, his desire that he has previously he had desire, that desire comes to an end. And then <clears throat> that is how he uh, destroy dependent on desire and this desire. Then <clears throat> thirdly he said uh, this body has originated from conceit. This uh, spiritual life and independence on conceit, conceit is to be abandoned. That means again, a bhikkhu hears another bhikkhu has attained full enlightenment by practicing samatha vipassana. Uh, jhanic meditation and concentration uh, and vipassana meditation. He attained full enlightenment. He is known to people. Then this particular monk who heard heard this, any particular monk, uh, any monk who heard this thinks, well, he is a man. I am also a man. He can attain the state, why not I attain the state? Uh, so he become a sort of uh, not jealous, but build up his uh, conceit, his pride. Well, if we can do, why cannot I do? So he strive the same way, work very hard, practice meditation, and attain the same state. So when the Ananda said, uh, in dependence on conceit, conceit is destroyed. This particular monk had conceit to attain great pride. Uh, he is a person, I'm also a person, he is he has a fire aggregates, I also have fire aggregates. He has a hands, legs, and mind and body. I also have hands, legs, mind, and body. If he cannot can attain it, why cannot I? So he picked up this uh, courage, enthusiasm, determination, pride, and use all this. He practiced and practiced and practiced he attained. Once he attained that state, his pride, his conceit will no longer be there. Asmi mana, this mana is a beneficial mana, meaningful mana. This conceit is 
meaningful conceit. Uh, so he destroyed this con- even that conceit when he attained the enlightenment. Now the last thing Venerable Ananda said to the bhikkhuni, who was very, very sick, and her sickness was a very strange kind of sickness. Uh, her sickness was uh, Venerable Ananda immediately recognized. He, he gradually uh, made her feel uh, calm. She was in, uh, she was very hot heat. He was, she was very, uh, what do you call it, excited. That was her sexual desire. That was a very, very strong, powerful sickness. For <laughs> that, Vendamalananda said, but in regard to sexual intercourse, the Blessed One has declared the dem- demolition, demolition of the bridge. Destroy the bridge. Break the bridge. Break the connection with this. As a monastic, you as the monastic, he or she must break it. Don't keep any slightest connection with that sickness. Because that is extremely dangerous for monastic life. As then the bhikkhuni felt so embarrassed she got up from her seat, fell on the ground, and uh, asked Venerable Ananda to forgive her. Forgive her, mischievous thought. And she lied to him. She asked this man, <coughs> uh, to go and lie to Venerable Ananda on her behalf. She told him, go and tell Venerable Ananda that she was ill, gravely sick, very serious, and ask him to come and see her. But in her mind, there was something else. And she she lied to him. He lied to Venerable Ananda. Venerable Ananda quietly went and sat down on a seat. As soon as he went there and saw her, the way she was lying down, and he immediately realized what was in her mind. Then he gave this very strong medicine. That is why the Buddha says, Ye keji osada loke vijyanti vidabahu dhammo osada samannati etam pivata bhikkavo dhammo osadam pivitvano adara maranasivam bhai vittvaj pasita nibhuta apadike monks. Out of all the medicines in the world, Dhamma is the best medicine. Dhamma is the best medicine. When you drink, and therefore you drink this medicine, then you will be totally cured from your sickness. This sickness of greed, desire, lust is very, very difficult to overcome, to cure, and Buddha has a medicine. <clears throat> so Venerable Ananda had learned this medicine and went and gave her 
then she immediately got well. In other places, Buddha gave them reciting both Janga, reciting ten uh, perception to Girimananda. When the Girimananda was sick, uh, he asked Buddha asked when the Valananda to go and recite ten perception. It's called Dasasanya. Uh, when other monks uh, sick, uh, Venerable, uh, uh, what do you call, Moggallana and Kasap and so forth, even when the Buddha was, uh, they recited Bodhjanga, Sata Bodhjanga. Now, in this case, <coughs> when she was sick, Venerable Ananda went and gave a very profound discourse, and she got cured. Now that, so Buddha used different uh, medicine on different occasions for different sicknesses. And therefore, Buddha said, Buddha's medicine, Buddha is called Visakko Sarlakattu. Visakko means, uh, uh, the, what do you call, physician. Uh, uh, Sarlakattu is surgeon. Buddha has both titles. And when the Malananda learned all this, and taught her, and then she got cured. <laughs> so, friends, uh, this is little uh, lighter uh, discourse. This uh, bhikkhuni uh, confessed and said, Venerable Sir, please forgive me, I made a very, very foolish thing. Uh, you committed a uh, uh, very foolish thing, committed transgression in uh, in that you so foolishly, uh, stupidly, and unskillfully behaved as you did. Uh, but since you see, uh, see your own transgression, and since you beg my pardon, I forgive you, and from now on, you behave well behave as a bhikkhuni and try to liberate yourself and get rid of your greed and lust. That's how he uh, and practiced <coughs> the noble eightfold path and became a noble bhikkhuni, Arya bhikkhuni. That was uh, when Balananda taught her and she was, after that, there was uh, very sensitive, felt very embarrassed and after that, she practiced Dhamma, and really she attained liberation. Okay, so that is uh, how he cured her, and now we have to go our for our uh, what do you call uh, meditation. <coughs> okay. No. Okay. Oh, okay. I hope you can see it. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds, whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long or large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth. May all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere. Neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother would risk her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless living friendliness. Above, below, and all around, 
unobstructed without hatred or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake. One should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision, removing desire for sensual pleasures. One comes never again to birth in the womb. With this metta thought in mind, let us meditate at least for the next 25 minutes. You may take <coughs> deep breath and breathe out deeply until all the air in the lungs is gone. And when you breathe in next time, you have lung full of air with full of oxygen that charges your red blood cell that go back to heart, heart pumps and bringing all this oxygen to every cell in our body from top to toes. That is what is happening 25,000 times a day. We breathe in and out, in and out. It is said that we breathe 25,000 times. I did not check it, but that is what I heard. Anyway, it doesn't matter how many times we pay attention to our breath. Notice the feeling that arises with the breath. Perception arises with the breath. Thought arising with the breath. Consciousness arising with the breath. And all of them very quickly change. New feeling, new perception, new thought, new consciousness arise. That too change very quickly while we are breathing in and out. This process also happening all the time. We don't know how many millions of times that this happened, but they all change very quickly. As we gain some concentration, we begin to notice these changes, at least through our vibration of our nervous system, we can understand something is happening, changing, something not permanent, they all are impermanent. Impermanent things are unsatisfactory. Unsatisfactory things are without self. So we know that these are not mine. I am not them. No, are they myself? This is important awareness, knowledge that we gain from mindfulness meditation. The purpose of this knowledge is to get rid of our greed, hatred, delusion. It definitely naturally happens when we pay attention to our breath, feeling, perception, thought and consciousness. That means the five aggregate practice, the aggregate of bodily, physical, then the feeling, perception, thought and consciousness are mental. All this mentality and materiality change all the time. And being aware of that, he breathe in and out.
By means of this meritorious deed, may I never join with the foolish, may I join always with the wise, until the time I attain Nibbana. May the suffering be free from suffering, may the fear struck be free from fear, may the grieving be free from grief, so too may all beings be. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, May all beings arisen in these realms, with form and without form, with perception and without perception, be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thanks. Now, Sorry. friends, this ends our morning session. And I want to share metta with all beings. Those who are in hospital suffering from various sicknesses taken care of by compassionate doctors, nurses, and hospital staff, may they all recover soon and return to normal life, practice Dhamma, meditation, and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering. May all the doctors, nurses who take care of these people also find peace, happiness, liberation from samsaric suffering. May all those who are in trouble spots in various places, discrimination, war zones, poverty stricken area, may they all find peace and attain liberation from samsaric suffering. May others who have lost their loved ones have been grieving. May they be free from grief, understand Dhamma, practice meditation, and attain liberation from samsaric suffering. May all those others who are in northern direction Northeastern direction, eastern direction, southeastern direction, southern direction, southwestern direction, western direction, northwestern direction, no up and down. Yeah. Beings living in these ten directions, wherever they are, let us share our metta with them and wish all of them peace, happiness, and liberation from samsaric suffering. Thank you, friends, for participating. Yeah. And we see <coughs> tomorrow morning with your question. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante Ji. Thank you, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you, Bante. Okay.